Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this session. Ask us anything about the voice to parliament. I'm so um, pleased to be joined by Professor Bronwyn Fredericks and the Honourable Matt Foley. Uh, my name's Amy McVie and I'm the CEO of QCOS. I'll begin by acknowledging that we're here on the land of the Turrbal and Yuggera people, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and, and emerging. Pay my respects to all First Nations people joining us today and to the uh, traditional owners of all of the lands you might be meeting us on uh, from across Queensland or indeed across Australia. Uh, I would also like to say that there is 11 or 12, if you count Saturday, days to go until the referendum. Uh, QCOS is really excited to be part of this history making process where we have an opportunity uh, to ensure that First Nations people have a voice to Parliament enshrined in the Constitution. Each of us have the ability to make that happen by voting yes uh, at, at the referendum. So today's session really is an opportunity uh, for the community services sector to ask anything in a really safe and supportive environment. Obviously, uh, QCOS is uh, a yes supporter, but it is really important that we continue to have uh, genuine and authentic conversations with the people we know to make sure that we all understand uh, the decision that we're making at the referendum. So um, it's really wonderful to have Bronwyn and Matt with us uh, to discuss with us the issues that um, surround the voice to parliament. And in terms of a um, outline for today, really it is um, our attempt to answer your questions. We have received lots and lots of questions prior to the event. Uh, so it's found to be a really great conversation. Uh, and also just wanted to say that we are broadcasting in teams and recording this session so people can watch it later. But if uh, you don't want to be involved in that, it's probably um, time to jump off now. By way of introduction, um, I'll, I'll introduce Professor Bronwyn Fredericks first. Uh, Bronwyn is a First Nations woman and Deputy Vice-Chancellor Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland. As an advocate for the Uluru Statement from the Heart and a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament, Bronwyn attended the national meeting of the Uluru Dialogues in Cairns in April 2022 and was in Yarrabah for the Yarrabah Affirmation. Bronwyn has published academic articles on and spoken about uh, both the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the Voice, to, um, Parliament, and the voice uh, referendum widely. Bronwyn has been directly involved in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community-controlled uh, organisations for over 30 years with a particular uh, focus and passion for education. We are also uh, really pleased and privileged to have Bronwyn as uh, a board director of QCOS. So welcome, Bronwyn. Thank you. Uh, by way of introduction of uh, Matt, so um, the Honourable Matt Foley is a barrister, former minister and social worker with a lifetime of service to the people of Queensland. His advocacy for Indigenous Australians and others facing disadvantage drew him to the law. Mr Foley served as a minister in four governments, including as Attorney General and Arts Minister for the Goss and Beattie governments. He has presented locally and internationally on the constitutional implications of the voice to Parliament. So, as you know, and as I've said, uh, the referendum is uh, 11 or 12 days away on October the 14th. So, uh, really, today is an important conversation for us to all make sure we've got our information straight and that we feel really empowered to have conversations uh, with the people around us. We know that the power is in those conversations uh, with trusted people, and so we hope today will help to empower you to have those conversations. So... I might just start um, with you, Bronwyn. We've received um, lots of questions about why the voice to Parliament's necessary and how and whether it will actually create any practical change. So, for example, uh, Bernadette from Coomera Limited says, how will Indigenous people benefit from a yes vote? Desley writes, really just want to understand how and why it will, this will deliver better outcomes than the current scenario. Emma from... Um, Gladstone Regional Council has asked, how will the vo voice result in real change and genuine improvement in remote, rural and regional Queensland? And Scott has asked, 
why is there no ex explanation as to why current organisations supporting First Nations people are failing and a voice would be the remedy? So Bronwyn, you have um, been involved in this movement for a long time, and as I said, including uh, with First Nations organisations. Can you please tell us um, why First Nations peoples have um, chosen the voice model and how it will create meaningful change? Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone out there um, across the QCOS footprint. Um, and it's great that people are interested and in here today to listen to the discussion. In terms of um, the process that's led to this referendum, if we look at the, you know, all of the meetings that have been held, um, there's been seven processes, um, 10 reports, uh, lots of uh, uh, meetings, roundtables. There's been 13 regional dialogues where people um, were asked to nominate people to attend the regional dialogues. The dialogues consisted of people who were elders, um, some young people, and other people that could speak in regards to matters around country and governance in their communities. Um, and those individuals at those regional dialogues then um, nominated the people that would attend the national meeting um, at Uluru, which we know is called the National Convention. So that happened in 2017. That follows off the back of years, that 12 years of process that we've had now, um, seven processes, 10 reports, 12 years, also follows off the back of work that was done previously in the decades before, where Indigenous people presented, whether it was the Barunga Statement, you know, the Larrakia Statement, the Irakala Statement, uh, William Cooper's petition in 1930, 38, all of those things have called for representation and they've all called for some form of representation as well. They've also raised issues around human rights. They've also raised issues around Indigenous rights. They've also raised issues around poor health and all of those things that are impacting in our communities. If you look at even the fact when we had COVID, when COVID commenced, and COVID still is an issue in many communities, but on that original response team, there was no Indigenous representation. Now, the services out there who work with people every single day will know that communities, um, some communities struggled around the responses, but the fact is we know that Indigenous people struggle and suffer with greater ill health, poor health status, higher infant mortality, all of those, you know, multiple chronic diseases as people age. And yet, despite being the most vulnerable poor, uh, health risk people in the country, there was still no Indigenous representation at that federal COVID response level. It took so much advocacy and agitation for that to happen, even to get that in, in this country, um, despite the poor health of Indigenous people. Secondly, last week we saw 125 health organisations come out across Australia collectively and sign an agreement including the Australian Medical Association, including nurses, including psychologists, including all public health organisations, all of those bodies saying the voice will make a difference because it will aim services directly onto the ground or in regions in a better way with communities being able to talk up. We know I can turn a tap on here in Brisbane where I am today and I can be guaranteed that I will get a fresh glass of water like that out of the tap. No, there are communities who have been repeatedly saying issues around their water for decades, and we know they cannot reliably still turn on a tap and get fresh water without making them sick. We know the cost of food in some remote areas, and I know because I worked in public health for, for years. Um, food pricing, we just had a food pricing inquiry two years ago in this country around remote communities. We know it's still an issue from two years ago, but we know it's also still an issue from 20 years ago. So those things are not improving. Mm. And the voice offers opportunity for communities on the ground to voice, voice their concerns up through their representation and then into that highest level in terms of the national, national mechanism. Um, it was decided that the voice uh, would go and precede a treaty and then we'd have, have um, you know, truth-telling. One has to think about, too, that treaties 
if you, you understand the law, and I didn't in terms of this part first, uh, or getting of, of gaining knowledge over time, is that treaties also are an act of parliament. We would have to get a treaty or treaties, even the Queensland Treaty still has to pass through the parliament. It becomes an act of legislation. We also know that Victoria has also been going six, nearly seven years in their treaty process, and they're nowhere near having any kind of draft or resolution of anything. They've only just elected their Assembly of First Nations, which is to guide the process of treaty making. There's no country in the world, and people can go and check this, there is no country in the world where, um, you know, agreement making has proceeded having some form of body or entity to guide the process. So the voice serves for that. Um, so there's all of that that comes into play. Mm -hmm. And there was one other thing you asked me there around what have services not done. Well, every year I see and I hear on the radio and I see on the TV and I hear politicians and big organisations say statements about closing the gap or close the gap. I hear about the failure to close the gap. In the work I do in the university and other areas, I see the statistics, but I also live the statistics. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people know and understand those statistics every single day in the communities in which we live and which people are connected to. We know the high death rates. We know the illnesses. We know the issues that happen. We know of young people or older people who may be incarcerated. We know that those stats are not moving and they're not moving in any way fast. The current services, even though they may say that's their greater effort and that's what they're trying to do something, unless we have a change to the very structures in which we operate, we are not going to see any substantial change. We're going to see a little bit of fluff and a little bit of incremental change around the size. We're going to see another yet another program change, another project, another initiative, but we are not going to see any substantial change in this country and communities are kind of what we heard through. And you can read all this in the documentation from the, from the dialogues and the meetings. It's all available online. You can see that communities have had enough. They, they just don't know how to keep going and how do we sustain ourselves. And I think that's a real reality here. A no vote gives us more of the same. A yes vote gives us opportunity for change. And that's what I'm looking forward and working towards right now, um, you know, in how we bring about some substantial change and not simply just fluffing around the edges. I will also say, and this is to all the services out there as well, who receive bulk or monies, 18% of the total Indigenous budget that's designated as Indigenous budget in this country goes to Indigenous specific services. Mm. The other 82% of funding that is designated Indigenous money actually does not go to Indigenous specific services. It goes to things like defence, foreign affairs, mainstream services, like not QCOS, but it goes to organisations like, and I'm going to name some, Anglicares, the Senate Cares, the Salvation Army, Red Cross, and we can go on around all the services that get cuts of money in regards to generic housing programs or all of those kind of, you know, support services. So the issue is not a, the issue is also a question for the sector to ask mm -hmm. that what are you doing to help close the gap? Where's your uh, mechanisms to ensure that you're aiming those services exactly where they should be? Where is the Indigenous staff on the ground? Where are Indigenous advisory groups feeding into how to do things better? So there's a, there's a message there for everybody around how we all do things better, but without any mechanisms, without any uh, regional dialogue or voice, how do we do that? So this does give us the opportunity this gives us an opportunity for change and this gives us a better future. Thanks. Thanks um, so much, Bronwyn. I think you've done a really amazing job there, of, um, particularly setting um, out the how, you know, sort of laying out for us almost 100 years of history of First Nations people organising and seeking voice and representation and that this uh, this referendum really is the culmination of decades and decades of consultation, engagement, mobilisation and efforts to seek a voice. Uh, and then sort of the, the why question, which 
is obviously best answered by First Nations people. First Nations people are able to identify the issues that need to be addressed and are able to determine the solutions to those um, problems or issues. Um, and so that's really what the voice is, is enabling, is uh, that right to self-determination, to determine how best to address um, the issues as identified by the community itself. Uh, the other kind of element then, I guess, is the what. So what is this really um, in, in sort of legal terms, I guess? What is the voice uh, and what would the amendment to the Constitution actually look like? So I might um, bring you in here, Matt, and ask you um, to just talk us a little bit, um, talk to us about um, how the Constitution will change uh, if the referendum is successful. Well, thank you, Annie. And um, let me uh, uh, acknowledge the great contribution QCOS has made over the years. I remember back when I was a social worker at the Aboriginal Islander Legal Service back between 74 and 78, QCOS played a very positive role in helping us um, facilitate contact for Aboriginal families with Aboriginal prisoners um, and uh, with the assistance of the Prisoners Aid Society. And uh, let me acknowledge uh, the honour in sharing a platform with uh, Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, whose um, leadership at the University of Queensland has um, uh, elevated the public discussion and debate on this very significantly. Um, to, to answer the question that uh, uh, Amy has uh, um, posed, uh, I start uh, with the words of the uh, amendment to the or to the constitution um, and they're up on the screen now so the the this is the new section 129 proposed to be introduced into the constitution and it um, sets out in plain terms uh, what are the words to be inserted and it um, provides as follows that, number one, that it's in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first people of Australia, um, uh, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. So it's a recognition of the scores of millennia that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been in Australia. And it's a recognition not by mere rhetorical puff, but by uh, doing something important, uh, something uh, modest yet profound. Uh, namely, this body called the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Voice, and that's in subsection one. Subsection two provides that that voice may make representations to the parliament and the executive government of the Commonwealth. Um, uh, on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and thirdly, that subject to this constitution, uh, the voice will have power to make, sorry, the parliament will have power to make laws uh, relating to the voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. So that helps to answer some of the questions that have been sent in. I, I noticed uh, there was a, a, a question that came in from Emmanuel uh, in Virina, is the advice of the voice mandatory? The answer is no. Um, it is a representation and um, it's a matter for the government and for the parliament to say yes or no. But it does enshrine the uh, into the constitution the function of the voice to uh, make representations. Uh, I note we've been asked by John Mayo, chief advisor to the government, or of the government Spinal Life Australia, does the Executive Council of the government have the final say on a particular proposal put forward by the voice? Um, uh, well, the Executive Council is the peak body of the um, executive government and uh, neither it nor the parliament is bound to follow the advice of the um, of the voice. Um, I'm asked how it will work in practice, and the answer to that 
uh, is found in those words, namely a working practice in accordance with uh, rules and procedures to be uh, determined by the parliament. Um, and the wisdom of that is that um, everybody gets a say in the parliament um, as to how things will work. And if something's not working, it can, it can be amended. But the new section 129, which is a new chapter, and that's a big deal for reasons that I'll go into in a minute, um, it's a it's um, it's it's enshrined. Can't be just uh, repealed. Uh, but the way it'll work in practice will depend. Um, uh, I would guess um, that it'll involve representations to uh, government about matters like um, health, education, housing, employment. Um, uh, in ways that uh, are, uh, are going to be helpful and beneficial to all of uh, all of Australians, uh, but particularly to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, the reason why this is important can, I think, be seen in the next slide, which is the current preamble to the uh, Constitution of Australia. Um, it's important to keep in mind that when back in 1788, when the colony of uh, New South Wales, the penal colony, was established. There was no uh, voice heard from Aboriginal people. When in 1859, Queensland was made a colony, there was no voice for Aboriginal Islander people. And in this constitution, the federal constitution passed by the, the British Parliament, the Westminster Parliament in 1900 and came into effect here in 1901, there's not a skerrick of a mention of uh, the people who'd been here before. Um, and it really cries out for remedy. Um, whereas the people of New South Wales, Victoria, etc., cetera, um, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, um, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and under the constitution hereby established. Not a, not a word, about the folk who were here before for scores of millennia. And indeed, as we know, the original constitution expressly forbade the counting of uh, Aboriginal and Islander people in the numbers for each state. Um, so this is a uh, preamble which shows scant regard for the um, position of First Australians. Moving then to the next slide, dealing with what does the Constitution do? Um, it, it provides for the establishment of the Commonwealth of Australia instead of the previous colonies, of course, of uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, Queensland and Western Australia. And it's based on the separation of three great powers. Um, the power to make laws of, of the parliament, which is chapter one, the power to administer laws, which is uh, chapter two on executive government, and the power to hear and determine disputes according to law, um, which is chapter three uh, under the, uh, uh, for the judicature, that is to say the courts. The doctrine of separation of powers provides that the liberty of a citizen is best enhanced when the power to make laws is separate from the power to uh, administer laws, is separate from the power to hear and determine disputes according to law. So um, the proposed new chapter does not alter that structure, but it does give a voice. Um, I won't go through the next, I'll go through the next slide just briefly, but this is what our constitution does. This, these are the chapters. You'll see in chapter one, I've, I've outlined the Senate, the House of Representatives, both houses of parliament, and the powers of the parliament. Um, chapter two sets out the executive government, chapter three, the judicature. Um, now, down the bottom is chapter nine, which is the one which is proposed in this referendum arising from the recommendations of, in the Uluru statement. Um, just, um, and, and on to the next slide, um, this is what 
the legislative powers uh, are conferred on the parliament by the constitution. A whole bunch of things, the power to make laws with respect to trade and commerce, taxation, defence, census and statistics, uh, all the things that the Commonwealth has power to do uh, set out there. Um, and the that will then include the power to make laws about the functions and procedures of the uh, of the voice. Back in 67, which was my last year at school, um, I'll go, go to the next slide. I can remember the sense of euphoria. Uh, um, I was uh, 16 at the time and I um, didn't get the, the right to vote. But it was a happy time of where the Australian people came together and said, well, this is ridiculous that, uh, that we're not um, counting uh, Aboriginal people in the numbers of each state. Um, and uh, the uh, um, there was a... a, a, a broad agreement amongst all political parties and people from different walks of life. Um, and that led to that referendum. Um, so that is a bit of a nutshell of the constitutional framework. Um, in short, it uh, uh, provides for something important, but it is not something which threatens or menaces the um, the parliament or the executive government and procedures and functions uh, can be sorted out in a sensible way by the parliament. Um, but what it does importantly is enshrine a recognition of Aboriginal and Islander people um, and a voice. Yeah. Can I just make please make a comment there that um you know if Matt, if we go back to the couple of slides where it says defence, uh -huh. um, yeah, like it's one word and then there's a little bit of a statement around defence, like it mightn't even be ten words, nine yes. or ten words. And if we look at marriage, for example, it's one word. Yeah. In the Constitution, marriage doesn't, there's nothing other than the one word that defines marriage. It just says marriage. And so there's no details, the same as there's the word defence and no details. It doesn't say for defence we shall have a naval force, an air force, an army, or those things should be called that. It doesn't say the size of them. It doesn't say we'll have submarines or helicopters or we'll have generals or anything. With marriage, there's no qualifier in the Constitution regarding is it any couples, is it same-sex couples, is it, um, you know, male, female, what is the term? That is all done through legislation. And the whole constitution is made up of principles like that and single words or like the words around that, the high court, even the high court. It doesn't say how long judges will serve. It doesn't say we'd have judges. It doesn't say where they meet. It doesn't say any of that. And that's the high court. That's all determined by legislation. So this issue around the detail of the voice is totally mischief making because if you really read the constitution, you would see that there's no details in the constitution. Like that's why I just I hear people who are politicians saying this stuff, and I go, but you work, live and breathe the law that comes off the constitution, and this you're contributing to misinformation and disinformation of a document that's part of your job. And so I find that really off-putting um, because everything else we work with in society, there's no details in the Constitution. So there's that. Secondly, we know from the history, and like I outlined earlier, you know, with the process, with we've had all the meetings and the roundtables, seven processes over 12 years um, in regards to this, that this was actually put on the table under former Prime Minister John Howard. And it was the, all of those meetings and gatherings were funded then, supported and funded by John Howard and then by former Prime Minister Tony Abbott and then by former Prime Minister, you know, Malcolm Turnbull and then former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. All that um, Anthony Albanese, our current Prime Minister, has done is put it to the people after he got elected in May 2022. So this has all been, you know, talk about bipartisan support of 67. We've had bipartisan support on this 
where the government has agreed. You know, Bill Shorten agreed, signed off on some things as well as did Scott Morrison, as well as did Tony, Malcolm Turnbull. All of that has been funded through bipartisan arrangements or agreement. Mm -hmm. And now we get to this where we seem to have lost that, which is really disappointing. And we see all the mischief making going. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to remind people out there to look beyond, um, you know, the shade throw and the cast and doubt, the uh, lies, um, the disinformation, misinformation to actually unpack and try and see what is really happening and why are they talking about everything except we go back to that first slide, Maria, of what this, you know, Matt's first slide around what this actual bill is about and the wording of this bill because that 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 Matt had earlier and spoke to, that is the crux of what we're voting for. Cool. It's not about land rights. It's not about native title. This is not about national parks. This is not about parking tickets that someone put out there. It's not about any of those things. It's actually about that that Matt spoke to. And there's some things, hey, realistically, that the voice may have no opinion on. It may not. It says it, It you know, it may. Mm. Well, there may, think, there may be things that society it will not. Mm. And so, you know, that's, that people are saying, oh, it's going to do this, it might do that. Well, what if it doesn't? What, what it's, it can choose not to on some things too. And really, as an Aboriginal person, if the voice was going to spend time mucking around, and I'll say that, mucking around, focusing on things like painting the colour of the new, you know, the for a factory at Parliament House or any of those things, I would get real wild because what they should be focusing on is things when communities raise about what is food, is about ill health, is about some of those things that are crux of the matter of making improvements in community, are things that I've heard in some communities and the work I've done previously with the Productivity Commission for Queensland is also around language revitalisation because we know that is an, is an issue. We know that water is an issue. We know that ill health is an issue. We know that rheumatic fever in some communities is an issue. You know, it's a big issue, rheumatic fever. We know that two people, two young kids are dying a week. Aboriginal kids are dying a week because of rheumatic fever. Do you think some of those federal members of parliament who've been in those regions where it's higher rates have mentioned that in parliament? No, they haven't. The voice can and the voice will. Uh, that is a really wonderful uh, summary and I think um, Matt, what I what I've heard in terms of what what's being sought here is um, well we reflect back to when the constitution was um, drafted as our founding document and it failed to recognise that there were people here Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and now in 2023 we have an op opportunity to right that wrong um, First Nations people are seeking recognition in the constitution. And that's what the amendment really does. It seeks uh, recognition for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It establishes a body which would be called a voice. Uh, that voice would be able to make representations, non-binding representations to parliament and the executive. So two arms of, of, um, of uh, the two of the three arms of government. Uh, and then finally, as is the case with all the other powers, uh, the parliament would be left to legislate around the detail of that voice. Uh, and so I think we've heard really, really um, beautifully from Bronwyn the history of the seeking of that voice, the seeking of that representation, and then the very important issues uh, that this voice is likely to focus on uh, rather than the things uh, that we might have um, heard, which are really uh, distractions from this fairly um, sensible, simple and modest proposal. Um, Bronwyn, I've got a question here um, from Donna from Tenants Queensland, um, and she says that as an Indigenous woman, considering uh, the treatment that First Nations people have experienced both in the past and presently, why should she and others trust that the voice would be any different? I can't, I can't, um, in true faith, um, not trust it because what's working now is not working. But what we say is working, what we have now is not working. And 
if we don't have some trust in a process that could work that has been led by Indigenous peoples over those years of um, putting out things, holding meetings, having dialogues, pulling people together that believe and looked at the law, have looked at examples overseas, you know, um, for what works, getting advice from overseas of what works for them as well in a legal way, um, what could work here, um, and having those discussions then back here. We have to take this opportunity. And I have the same fears in the sense and I have the same mistrust in some government and we see that like I said with rheumatic fever we've seen some politicians not even you can check a hand salad and you can see that they haven't raised issues around rheumatic fever they haven't raised issues around you know what's called Hansen's disease but it's leprosy they're still found in some indigenous communities we see they haven't raised the issues of the ongoing trachoma we see that you can read it in hand salad so I have to I have to believe that this will make a difference and secondly um, I have faith in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I know that Aboriginal and Torres the reason we have the things we have now is because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have fought for them. They fought for every single thing we have, whether it was the right to education. They fought to get the 1967 census. That comes from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. William Cooper presented the, the petition in 1938. People presented the Barunga Statement. People presented, you know, all of those things that have been presented by Aboriginal and Torres Strait people. And in the past, they've given, been given to politicians. And politicians have taken those things, those statements, those petitions, and they you can go and look at them down at Parliament House. Many of them are behind perspex. You know, the Barunga Statement's there in the Parliament House, in the new Parliament House behind perspex, and it's in the public viewing area. The reason the Uluru Statement, which lays out voice, treaty, truth, was gifted to the people of Australia because nothing else has worked. And there was more faith in the people of Australia to bring this about than there is in politicians. I also believe that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't go to meetings intentionally to cause harm to other Indigenous people. We all, regardless of our area of work or our community life, go to meetings to try and bring things that are better for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I believe and have faith that in our own people who have guided this process and have worked really, really hard for this process, that this will work. Um, thank you, Bronwyn. And also, can I encourage you to keep um, putting your questions uh, through because we're really, really keen um, to answer as many as we can this morning. I've got a question, um, again, I'll direct it to you, um, Bronwyn, from Laurie uh, from FEET. And um, Laurie is asking why some First Nations people are voting no and what are their, what are their concerns? Um, I can't answer necessarily why they, what their concerns are. I've listened to some of them, um, the concerns, but some of them I struggle to understand the depth of it once you understand for me, um, and I'll just unpack that a little bit, but first of all, I'll say that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't have to agree. We don't agree. Like, God, if we, if we wanted to look at where we're going to live or any of those things, we wouldn't agree on that. And and all non-Indigenous people don't have to agree on things. So why should Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people all have to agree? I think it's a little bit um, problematic to think that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have to agree on every single matter, including this. Um, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, and Torres Strait Islander people have diverse opinions, but we know that the majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do agree on the voice and that this is a way forward. Mm. We know that people nominated people to attend regional workshops. We know people have gone to other meetings. We know that on the grounds across communities right now, Nationally, people are doing the work, whether it's up in Tiwi Islands, whether it's down in Kaumyama, or whether it's down in Port Augusta. People are having meetings around the country in regards to the voice and the possibilities of what this will mean. So that is happening. The people that may push the treaty first necessarily got their own views, um, got their own opinions. I've looked into that. Um, 
Because at first I thought that was the way to go, but once I also understood that in Victoria, they elect their first assembly of First Nations, that's guiding the process of treaty. When I understood that um, treaties are all subject to override, they are an act of parliament, the Queensland Treaty would be over, subject to override by the Queensland Parliament. Parliament still has supremacy over the, the treaty, if you get the treaty. And above all, Federal Parliament has ultimate capacity to override the Queensland Treaty or any other treaty in this country. So without any mechanism, without any voice to it, without any guiding process to it. So that is problematic from that. And other people would have issues around they say it's about sovereignty. This is not about sovereignty. Sovereignty has never been ceded and never will be. Mm -hmm. So this, the question of sovereignty is not on the table. This is an advisory body mm -hmm. to try and make things better, to guide a process and a pathway forward, to advise government on laws and policies that are directly related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait people. It's not about sovereignty. It's not about land rights. It's not about land. It's not about native title. Yeah, so... Um, I've sort of unpacked that for me and what it means for me when I go to cast my vote. And everyone has to unpack that for themselves. All Aboriginal and Torres Strait people have to do that. But please don't expect us all to agree. Please don't expect us all to have a position for you to cast your vote. If you feel compromised, any of you around, or my Aboriginal friend is voting no. I want you, and I want to, I want to support them. Just remember this, you are supporting that person who happens to be Aboriginal as your friend, and you are supporting them at the cost then of the majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people to support one person who happens to be your friend and happens to be Aboriginal. And there's a very expedient difference between those two things. Thank you. So uh, we're looking forward to the 14th of October and I know um, from a QCOS perspective we're looking forward to supporting a successful yes vote and we remain highly optimistic that that is going to be the outcome and I almost hesitate to ask a question which has come in but I think it's probably important to talk both to you Matt and to Bronwyn about this um, and the question um, comes from uh, Andy from IWA Checkup. Um, and Andy wants to know, uh, what are your views if the outcome is no? Um, what does that mean for, for First Nations people? And, and I'll end and for it a bit, uh, not just for First Nations people, what does a no vote mean for our nation? Well, in answer to the first question, what are my views if the vote outcome is no? The answer is, I don't know. Um, I shall be sad. I shall be disappointed. Um, and I shall listen to a cavalcade of finger pointing about his to blame and so on. Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, uh, in answer um, to the question, what does this mean for First Nations people? So I'll, I'll leave that one to, to, to Bronwyn. Um, from my point of view, um, it is a great opportunity. Well, let me put it this way. All of us as parents have a job, among other things, to teach our children respect for the rule of law. And part of that is that they should be familiar with um, the basis on which our laws are made. Now, the very bedrock of the rule of law in Australia is the Constitution. And uh, if we can flick back up on the screen, the second slide, uh, which seems to me uh, more fitting to a, um, a Monty Python sketch, no, no, the next one, yeah, than to a, a true uh, acknowledgement of uh, the um, bedrock of the rule of law in Australia. Um, it should be corrected so that we can say with some confidence to our kids, well, look, this is part of the rule of law, this is why it's a, it's a fair foundation and uh, it's the basis on which the various parliaments make, make their laws. Um, so um, uh, my efforts, uh, I suppose, like everyone else, is trying to focus on uh, putting the case um, 
uh, listening uh, to what the no campaign has to say. Um, I've not been persuaded by it, um, and I uh, um, shall be very sad because it seems to me we will we'll not have um, given, uh, we will not have taken an opportunity to uh, get an honourable, just and truthful basis to our federal um, constitution. So the 14th, you mean the 15th when you wake up? Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm working towards the 14th and a successful outcome. That's my focus of the 14th, mm -hmm. is getting to the 14th. On the 15th, regardless of the outcome, communities will have to pick up the pieces. We will have to gather and wherever we are and also, you know, start to work through what it means. There will be heartbreak regardless of the outcome. There will be heartbreak if it's a no. The people that have worked for gen for decades for yes, some of our older people who have been leading the movement, not just for the voice but the movement overall, and I'm talking elders who are significant in the political movement, will walk away, and that breaks my heart. Uh, they will walk away if it's a no vote. That's what will happen. I will work here in Brisbane and Ipswich um, to bring people together where we at the uni will support young people and older people who come in off campus. We book some areas off campus to have elders and to have counsellors and to do some gentle work for the day and I encourage services to think about their Indigenous staff and some of their non-Indigenous staff who've been part of this um, for a long time to um, take time out and to work through a process so that we can deal with and manage things going forward. That will be where we are. I think the other thing is to think about that the Uluru Statement in full is called the Uluru Statement from the heart. And see, I'm getting emotional, but there's a lot of things vested in this for a lot of people. It is called from the heart. It comes from the heart of Australia in terms of Central Australia, but it also is from the heart of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are playing part of the processes or part of the dialogues, who were the representatives and the nominated people to attend. I never expected to attend a regional dialogue and people who think and say, well, I should have, I, I wasn't told, maybe need to think about, is that your role? Because if it was about education, and if it was about maybe public health, but education, too right I would have been saying, how come I'm not considered to be nominated? But it wasn't. It was about a whole range of other things and around governance and around going forward and about law and about ways of looking at representation. I was happy with who went from South East Queensland and I was happy with who was nominated to go to the Uluru from here. I was happy for them because I also knew they'd do the right thing. So I know there's a lot vested in this, you know, in terms of faith and trust. I also know that this is regarded as peace and as, a, and as an offering and a gift to the people of Australia. And no will mean Australia has rejected the gift. And I don't think people have comprehended that. It's a way forward. It's a way forward to saying we've had enough, that people want peace, that communities can't keep sustaining what they are, that how many years of close the gap reports are we in for, how much loss will we experience going forward, where will it be and what will it be to be Indigenous in 50 years' time because we won't get this ground back. We've heard statements about a second referendum, that won't happen. We've already heard one one politician say it'll be a second referendum and another politician who has some sort of balance of power or hold of power say they won't. So that, that will not happen. It won't happen in my lifetime and it probably won't happen in the lifetimes of the people that are watching the 
the webinar today. So what does that mean? And as I said, what will it mean to be Indigenous in this country in 50 years or 100 years' time? I'll also say that Professor Megan Davis and Arnie Pat Anderson have called this Uluru Statement a love letter from the Aboriginal people to Australia. So what does that mean in terms of saying we hold faith in non-Indigenous people of Australia going forward? And that's also unresolved. What does that mean? So there's a lot of things to think about and process and work through. And what it does mean, if we get a no, is more of the same. It offers us more of the same. And I'll just outline that. If we get a yes vote, there will be that, what you said in 67, mm. there will be that sense of, you know, joy. Mm. There will also be what does it mean and what happens next. Mm. Because some of the old people that have been involved will step aside because they also know they've done their job and they've done the work that they were committed to do. Mm -hmm. Some have died along the way. But they had faith that we would deliver, you know, we would collectively deliver this. And I remember the meeting at Yarrabah. There was one elder man who was part of the 67 campaign team and he passed away in the last few months. Um, but it was announced, the referendum was announced, so he, he died knowing him. Mm. And all of those people have been part of the belief and so there's that thing. So yeah. we'll still have to work out what we do. We'll still have to work and sit and resolve the feelings that people have, mm. whether it's yes or no. And we still have to live in this country together, together. Mm. Whichever path Australia decides on the 14th, I just know how I'm voting. There isn't a lot of time left. I just say to people, don't wait to be invited now. Mm. Don't wait to be up, to, to be encouraged. Don't wait to be affirmed. Every conversation, every action from today onwards till the closing of the poll on the 14th of October makes a difference. Don't wait to be asked. Just go out and do it. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, Jordan from Aquarius has asked um, a question that you've sort of answered there, which is about um, how First Nations people feel about the referendum and how the actual process has had an impact. And I think you spoke really beautifully about, or well, what I heard was uh, actually about strength, because uh, in order to put forward something which is vulnerable, because the words that you've used around seeking peace, um, a love letter, um, giving a gift, those things, um, when you behave in those ways, you are making yourself vulnerable. Mm. To be able to make oneself vulnerable in that way uh, requires great strength. Well, great humility. I think yeah. humility, when I look at some of the elders and people out there, the elders that you work with in your community, so many of them have great integrity and humility, mm. despite everything that's happened. And you think about it, mm. the missions, the reserves, the moving around, the separations, the stolen generations, the deaths in communities, incarceration, all of the things that have happened. Communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait people keep going. Mm. But how much can we keep going? Mm. And that's the question. Mm. And how long do we sustain closing the gap? How long do we keep that, you know, as front and centre and be measured and not thrive? Why should communities still be in a position of surviving, mm. not thriving? You know, why, why, why is that? Mm. And as I go back, what will it be to be Indigenous in 50 years' time? I see young people at the university, young Indigenous people, just like non-Indigenous people, I see them carry the weight of that. Mm. They're so full of hope and promise, but they also carry the weight of history. Mm -hmm. They carry the weight of history from their communities and their families from which they come from. They also, you know, when you say how's it impacted on Indigenous people, I see those young people, we are giving them so much support and love and care just to make it through at the moment where they're having sessions for themselves as Indigenous young people on the referendum and what does it mean 
Mm. You know, and they're confused, but they're also full of hope. Some are confused, but then the confusion subsides. Because they also got exams to have. Yeah. They also got things to do. <laughs> but this is front and centre for many of them as well. So they are full of hope. And the non-Indigenous young people that I work with are also full of hope in terms of seeing things for a future generation, a future pathway for themselves. They're the ones that carry it on after us. And if I can just say these final words, you know, when I move around uh, in doing some of the presentations I do, whether it's with a CWA group or a Rotary Club or, you know, University of Third Age or any of these other groups, older people, Matt, you might be interested in this too, older people say, you know, they remember 67, yeah. they're alive, well, they voted. Some of the people I spoke to and have spoken with, they voted in 67 and they can't wait to tell you that. Mm. They're very happy and joyful, they did. And they tell me they're voting yes. Um, the ones that voted no in 67 also in some party vague questions, or they've sort of deferred let others talk. And it's become very quick. You see that very quick over time. And it's caused me to think about for us in this generation now, you and me, we, what do we want our descendants to remember us for mm. as ancestors of the future? How do we want to be remembered? Do we want to be remembered as the ones that changed history? Do we want to be the ones that are remembered with joy that my mum or my auntie or my nan or my wife or my uncle did this and, and changed the course of history and recognised Indigenous people in the Constitution and realised the rights that Indigenous people have in terms of having a voice, having an advisory body? Or did they vote no? And do they evade the question in the years to come? Mm. And we have to remember that. What kind of ancestor are we going to become? So we've got only a few minutes left. And I think um, this question from Maggie from the Housing Older Women's Movement is a great sort of end point, which is to say, which is to acknowledge we've got a, we've got a bit of time left. Um, we've all got a platform. We've all got networks. We've all got people we can talk to. What are what is sort of the most compelling things that we can say and do uh, in the lead up to the referendum? How can we have those conversations with uh, people who still haven't decided or people who uh, could be persuaded? Um, I think um, the first thing is to um, listen. Uh, if a person is interested and they're inclined to a no vote, um, or if they simply don't know, um, to listen to what they have to say um, uh, and uh, to deal with the, um, what I think is a silly argument, but the proposition, if you don't know, vote no, mm. seems um, um, illogical. If you don't know, find out. <laughs> um, Talk about everything else, right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, you can help them find out by listening um, and um, in a in a in a positive way without um, making it too uh, you know, blaming one side or or the other. Um, I think um, um, put the case um, be civil um, and. Uh, um, respect the person with whom you're speaking, and uh, um, you know you you, you may get uh, more you may get more uh, uh, interest with um, honey than vinegar. Yes, and every conversation counts. So don't just also assume that the people in your immediate circle are all voting the way you are. You need to check in with them, find it out, as Matt says, have the conversation and listen. And all the circles of influence you have, whether it's a dinner table, whether it's your work colleagues, whether it's the colleagues in the building next door to you or the place next door to you, whether it's your neighbours, your street, your football club, your sports club, your crafts club, your church, there's one, one weekend left. Um, all of those circles of influence you have. I wear badges and things at the checkouts when I did my shopping 
inevitably I get asked while I'm shopping, when I go to the butcher shop, all of those things, the green grocers, the markets, every point, every conversation from this point on going forward matters. Uh, for me, I'm focusing on those people that are undecided and those people that don't have enough information. I take information with me in my bag. If I don't have things, you know, the official type flyers or info, I've printed things off the net. There is so much information available out there. Mm. So I advise you to check yeah, the websites, sure. um, download um, information, just make sure it's credible information and not more of the, you know, the misinformation and disinformation I spoke about. It's credible information. Give that out. It's 11 and a half days. Every day will matter. Every conversation matters. And every single vote in this referendum will matter. Every single vote. So go ahead, just go for it. Don't wait to be, as I said, invited. Don't wait to be affirmed or encouraged. You don't wait to be asked. You just need to go and do it. So, if, if, uh, I'm not sure if we're winding up now. We are. Yeah. Can I just mention one thing quickly? Sure. And could I respectfully uh, ask that? that slide of uh, leaving the last words as it were with the great uh, Aboriginal poet Kath Walker mm -hmm. who was a champion of the uh, yeah, of the uh, uh, 1967 referendum I think you'll find it uh, either right at the end or um, uh, the one before the end um, I had the honor of um, working with um, Kath Walker Udra Nunapal, um uh, in my time at the Aboriginal Trust Island, Lynn Sue, she was an inspiring, powerful uh, person, a very fine poet, um, uh, a, a very fine poet uh, of international acclaim. But um, she, uh, Bronwyn, spoke movingly of hope. Well, she wrote a poem called Song of Hope to our father's father. And this is the last stanza to our father's father's, the pain, the sorrow, to our children's children. A glad tomorrow. I think Kath sums it all up. Yep. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt and um, Bronwyn, for such a wonderful session. It is really wonderful to finish on that um, note of hope, um, to keep that feeling of hope in our hearts, to remember that this is a gift of love uh, from First Nations people to Australia and to embrace an opportunity to be part of history making. Uh, after this session, we'll send out an email with resources that you can use to help uh, further um, inform you in conversations that you might be able to have in the next 11 or so days. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and uh, we look forward to supporting a yes vote on the 14th of October.